Hey, just so you know, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, so appreciate your pastor's football team, who happens to be the Carolina Panthers, who you I see how it's going to be today. All right. Well, how I see it, I've got the mic and you don't. So there we go. And I think I will pray harder for my team to win than for yours. No, how we're trending right now, that is just not, that's not going to be, that's not going to be good for us. But anyway, somebody can hope, right? Right? Anyway. Hey, it's good to see everybody. Thanks for all of you who are here on our campus, for those of you who are online, as we are diving into week two of our four series. Last week was all about how we as a church are for the gospel. And this week, it's all about how we as a church are for you and why that is. Because in this entire series, it is based on our vision as a church to be a church for the valley. And so we're just parsing that away week after week to see the importance and the significance of what that means in the most simplistic yet profound scriptural ways for all of our lives. And so that's what we're doing. And so last week we passed out something called our four guidebook. And I wanted to encourage you to bring them every single week. So if you got one last week and you brought it back, go ahead and get that out. If you did not get one last week, you weren't able to be here, uh, guess what? We got one for you. So will you do me a favor? Hey, if you weren't able to get one last week and you want to be in the know of what's going on, will you just slip your hand up just real quick? We got some awesome volunteers in the back. They're going to put one of these in your hands. So keep your hands up for a second so they get a, a, a moment. We want you to know that inside this, let me just go over real quick so you don't spend the next five minutes trying to read it from cover to cover. There's a letter from me. There's a little historical timeline about all the great things that God has done in and through Bridge Church. There's some specifics about the primary and secondary goals of the four initiative. There's a commitment card in there. I'll talk about that in just a second. And then towards the back, there are sermon notes. Now, the sermon notes part is where I want you to go ahead and meet me now. Go ahead and make your way over to the sermon notes. It should be around on page 23 today for the For You message. And as you're making your way there, inside, you remember last week, there's a commitment card. The commitment card right here shows the kind of gift that you're asking God God, what do you want me to commit over these next two years above and beyond my regular giving? And all I want us to do with these right now is to put them in a place of prominence in our house, our apartment, our dormitory, wherever you are. Some place that you see it, for us, it's our kitchen island that we'll see it. And as we see it, we pray about it. Because I said it and I'll continue to say it. There's two things. When we ask the Spirit for us to do things we typically haven't done before, there's kind of two responses that we feel. What the Spirit is asking us to do in a courageous capacity, and then what our flesh wants to do in a cautious capacity. And so be praying about that, discussing that, asking the Lord, Lord, what's my, here it is, what's my contribution to what you're doing? Because this is the Lord's work. This is kingdom work. I like how Jake said it. It's going to be verbiage you hear all the time. This is the fastest growing, most underserved area in our valley. And it fits right into our, our vision. And so it's an exciting time for us to be thinking about this. Now, he said next week is significant. And that's, that's an understatement. Next Sunday night at 5.30 out at the Rio Mesa property, we are having advanced commitment night. And what that means is for those of you who are like, I've been praying about this and God has given us a number and we know that we want to lead out with first fruits. We know that we're supposed to give right now. And so we're going to have this great celebration out on the property, 5.30 next Sunday night. You just bring out, I mean, it, it's going to be like Lollapalooza, uh, Woodstock kind of you feel. Like bring, bring out your own chairs and stuff like that. Bring out some food. It's going to be great to be out there. And we've got some special things planned for you. So uh, in the meantime, right now, get to page 23. Am, am I right on that? I think I am. Page 23 three in your guidebook as we are looking why as a church we are for you. But let's pray. Lord, thank you that you, you love us in ways that many times we 
haven't fully grasped. And my prayer today is that we would grasp that. We would understand the degree to which you love us. That we would understand that you've lavished grace on us, that you have called us sons and daughters, that you have extended the invitation for us to be children of the one true most high God. So Lord, would you just overwhelm our hearts and our minds, enlarge them to the transformational truth of what your word has to say about us according to what you have done to the praise of your glory. In Christ's name, amen. amen. So I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, December 1st, 1975. So that just means uh, two things. My birthday's coming up, well, whatever. I just want you to know that. <laughs> December 1st. So December 1st, 1975. December 1st, 1975, I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana. And the birth certificate I received read Andrew Joseph Hunt. It was my birth name from my mother's first husband. My wife always jokes now, she's like, really, I could have been Megan Hunt? Like, what a cool last name. I was like, eh, yeah, but you got Smith, so sorry about that. <laughs> and along with it, about a million other Smiths. And so how'd I go from Hunt to Smith? Well, you gotta understand that in August 9th, 1979, the Superior Court of Marion County, Indiana decreed me legally Andrew Joseph Smith. See, you should see a picture up here in just a second. Those are my adoption papers. Actually, this is the original copy of my filed adoption paper with Marion County Superior Court. These are my adoption papers right here. It's really, it's really kind of cool. And it says that on August 9th, 1979... Harry M. Smith legally adopted me as his son. See, between my mom's first husband and, and marrying my, my dad, she was a single mother with a three-and-a-half-year-old. He wanted to marry her, and in also wanting to marry her, wanted to make me his son. And with that, the significance of that is it changed who I legally belong to. He said, I don't want to just love this family. I don't want to just love this boy. I, I, I want to commit to him by going through the legal need in order to adopt him. He doesn't just come with the package. He is mine. That's what that says. And at the same time, with the legal adoption, I was given a new identity. My identity was changed, along with all the rights and the privileges that came with now being his legally adopted son. I was adopted into an entire family that I was now a part of. Who, who I was before, after August 9th, 1979, changed. My name was changed, my identity was changed, who I belong to changed. And I want to ask you how weird that would be if I showed up next Sunday and I just want to say, hi, good morning, I'm the lead pastor here at Bridge Church, my name is Andrew Hunt. And you'd go, what? He hit his head on the way in. And we should probably look into that. I go, well, no, I mean, I was born Andrew Hunt. You go, yeah, 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 yeah. Your, your response, if we're having a conversation, you'd go, yeah, but that's not who you are. I go, yeah, but that's who I was born. Like, that was the name given to me, yeah. But you would go, but don't you remember what you, but you said? Like, you were legally adopted. Your name was, was changed. Like, it can't be reversed. You are Andrew Smith. And I was like, yeah, but like, I remember, like, this is what I was born. But my adoption changed everything. And I think one of the greatest issues that us as followers of Jesus deal with is looking back at who we think we were and failing to recognize the significance of what it means that we have been adopted by God. What that means for who we are, who we belong to, all the rights and the privileges and the inheritance that comes with that. 
that you went from separated from God to child of God. And that is why we as a church are for you. If God is for you to the degree that he gave his son that you might become a child of his, adopted in his family, man, we are for you too. And it's one of the greatest stories and messages that we can share with an onlooking world. That God doesn't become somewhat pleased with you. That God adopts you. He calls you into his family. And so I want us this morning to take a look at a passage out of Ephesians chapter 1. So if you've got a Bible or a device or something like that, and be taking lots of notes, pardon me. <coughs> We're going to be in the New Testament book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, looking at verses 3 through 6. And let me tell you something about, like Ephesians is one of my favorite books in the New Testament. And simply because the first 14 verses, the first 14 verses as you're making your way there, in the original language is one long run on sins. Because it talks about who we are positionally in Christ, in Christ. Paul is just, if you get this... If you get this visual of what's happening as he's dictating to a scribe who's writing this frantically, as he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down what then generations and millennia of people would hear. There's this this run-on sentence for 14 verses that just talks about the magnificence of who God is and what it means for us to be in Christ. And so we pick up in verse 3, and this is what he says. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Say every with me. Every. Every. He's blessed us with a few spiritual blessings. Occasional spiritual blessings. Blessings contingent on how good you are and how well you get it right all the time. He's blessed you with blessings in proportion to what you can do for him. That's not what it says. It says, in Christ, he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Here it is. In Christ. Underline that. Circle it. Highlight it. Dog ear that page and don't you ever forget it. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted. Adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished. I love that. He lavished. That means pouring it out without end to the point in which it goes beyond saturation. Lavished on us in the beloved one. Here's what I want you to pay special attention to in that passage, that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing In Christ, say it with me, in Christ. Look, in Christ or in the Lord is paramount to the writings of Paul in the New Testament. Remember last week as I started off this series, the four series, I said prepositions have power, correct? Well, so does the preposition in. It says who we are and where we are positionally with God. That we are in Christ. It's so important that the phrase either in Christ or in the Lord, Paul uses throughout the New Testament, what, a dozen times? 50 times? No, 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 no. 164 times. I'll tell you one thing. As a parent, when we repeat ourselves, we want our kids to pay attention, right? When the Lord, when the good father repeats himself through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the writer Paul, and he uses in Christ or in the Lord 164 times, he wants us to know this is important. This is who you are and where you are positionally in Christ. And you know why it's so important? Here it is. Here it is. I'm going to give one word. It's so important because it has everything to do with identity. It has everything to do with our identity. Not only who we are, but where we are positionally before God. We are in Christ. And here's why it's so important for us to preach on and understand the significance and the magnitude of identity is because many Christians, maybe some in this room, are living subpar Christian lives not due to a lack of information, but truthful transformation. That means you're not quite sure of the implications of what it means that you have been adopted. 
adopted as a child of God. You might understand it theologically or intellectually, but personally, you are still living as though you're ostracized from God. But you know what? And I see, and I say this is, is true because, I'll just be honest with you, I've been a pastor now a pretty long time, and some of the most miserable human beings that I have met walking the face of this beautiful earth are followers of Jesus. Just miserable, mean, cantankerous people. Insecure, you're like, easy, easy there, pastor. Because you, you, somebody's like, I think he might be talking about me. I'm not talking about you in particular, unless that's you, and then I am talking about you. <laughs> and some of the most miserable, just frustrated, failing, struggling, angry, bitter, resentful people, and they're like, I love Jesus. I'm like, really? What is it exactly that you know? And they got big old Bibles, bigger than any Bible that I've ever had. And they've got it like color coded and highlighted and circled. And they can recite all these passages. And they have achieved this place of intellectual ascent. But the truth has not transformed them positionally in their understanding. That they are a child of God. And everything that comes with that. Therefore, if you do not know who you are positionally, if you do not know your identity, you will allow something or someone else to define it for you. Because some voice in your life, some influence in your life will determine your identity. A voice from the past, a boss in the present, a hope for the future, something will determine your identity. But you only get to be determined and defined by the one who's adopted you. See, listen to this. God is so for you in Christ, he does away with the old you. That's why your adoption is so necessary to understand. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I just said? I'm gonna say it again for the kids in the back. That God is so for you in Christ, he does away with the old you. I, I wanna read to you an, an article that's on page Three or page two, article three in my adoption papers. Listen to what it has to say. It says the State Board of Health of the state of Indiana is hereby ordered to issue a new birth certificate for Andrew Joseph Smith and to seal the birth certificate heretofore issued for Andrew Joseph Hunt. Did you track with that? Do you track with it? So as part of this adoption, a part of these ratified legal binding documents, the court is ordered to issue me a new birth certificate. I was three and a half years old. A new birth certificate that read Andrew Joseph Smith and to legally seal my original birth certificate that read Andrew Joseph Hunt. So you're like, uh, okay, pastor, like, I think I'm tracking with you. So what does it mean to have a previous birth certificate sealed? Well, thank you, internet. Here's the legal reasoning behind that. Listen to this. What does it mean to have an original birth certificate sealed? It means the original document and the information included in it is inaccessible to the public, and with some exceptions to the subject it refers to. Here's what it means. My original birth certificate is not accessible to anybody. Nobody can get a hold of it because according to everybody, legally binding, it does not define who I am today. And in the state of Indiana, I don't even have access to it. It is filed, it is sealed, it is separated away because that young man, on August 9th, 1979, forever changed to Andrew Joseph Smith. And what was, was filed away. Inaccessible. And this isn't just legal significance. For us and our adoption to God the Father, this has theological significance. Because you know what we want to do many times. We want to try to dig through some old files and look back for that birth certificate. 
We remember kind of the echoes of what we were called or what somebody said about us. We want to look back and, and, and believe something about us that God has declared null and void. He has spoken something else over us, declared us to be someone else. So much so theologically, this is what the scripture says about the new birth in which we receive in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Did you hear that? N new creation. Upgrade. Polished up version of the old. That's not what it says. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Listen here, church. This is what we want to do many times. We want to go through uh, the files of our past and pull out the birth certificate that says the old Jew, right? Maybe we're having a bad day. Maybe we're in a bad season, a situation. Maybe somebody triggered us by something they said or they did that harkens us back to a time that doesn't define what Jesus and God says about us now. And so we, and so we pull up that old Jew and we open it up and you're like, yeah, that's who I am and, and, that's, and that's what I do. But here's what the scriptures tell us is that in Christ, the old has passed away, sealed up. Uh, uh, I'm not going to cut my tongue uh, and put that here. Sealed up and made inaccessible to us. Inaccessible. This is not who you are anymore. This is then taken and filed away to a place in which we can no longer get granted access. And what we have been given is a new birth certificate that declares you a new creation in Christ. Your past does not define you. The hurts and the wounds and the voices and the echoes of the things that have transpired before is not who you are. There is the voice of one, and he says you are son of God, most beloved. You have been given a new creation certification. And that is why it's so important for us to understand our identity. Because it changes everything. That we are a new creation. I'm not just a little bit better than I used to be. God sees me in Christ as something altogether new. Somebody say amen. amen. What that means is you're not at odds with God anymore. Check this out. God likes you. You're like, well, you should have seen me last week. No. His love isn't contingent on our degree of perfection. Somebody need to hear that. His love compels us towards holiness. His love compels me to live to a standard that he knows is best for my life. But his love does not vary based on my degree of goodness. You understand that? You're not working for God's affection. He's already given it. You just have to embrace it. You're not at odds with God anymore. Hey, so many people are just walking around going, oh, God just doesn't like me today. I was just a, I was a bad Christian. See, we, we, we use very horizontal understandings in our vertical relationship with the Lord. He's like, yes, I want what's best for you, but how good you are doesn't determine God's love for you. Because we're new creation, we can forgive where we used to resent. Isn't that great? In our relationships with other people, we can forgive other people. And here's the thing. If we understand our new identity and what we received in God, that we have been forgiven because of the finished work of Jesus, therefore what we have received, we can show and demonstrate to others. Isn't that powerful? That we can let go. You don't have to hold on to that thing that's like poisoning your soul, that's weighing you down, because you're not built for divinity, only God is. He took that on him so you wouldn't have to keep it on you, amen. Therefore, you can let go of those hurts and those wounds and the things. That doesn't mean you run back to a toxic, abusive, horrible situation. 
Forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean best friends skipping through the streets for the rest of your lives. It's being able to let go. And you can do that wherever you are because of what you received and your new identity. That because you're a new creation, you can show love where you used to demonstrate hate. That's the power of grace. God loved us when we were unlovable. I still believe that that is going to be the catalytic light that goes on for the church of Jesus in our country when followers of Jesus realize the degree in which we were loved and we begin to love other people, whether they vote like us, whether they even worship in the same places that we worship, regardless of where they've come from or the convictions that they have. But before we go in with judgment, we come with love. And I believe that will be the most transformational thing that we will ever see. People will look at us and they go, they are a weird, peculiar people. But the Jesus they talk about is a Jesus they demonstrate. We're able to love because we are a new creation. I think you're going to realize when I talk about identity, you're not just an upgrade of who you used to be. Isn't that nice? Like You're not an iPhone upgrade. That all of a sudden God shut you down and it was like, doo, 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 and you see the line and you're like, oh, is this going to happen? Is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? No. Like He took that junky Samsung that you have <laughs> and he gave you an iPhone. Because it's right and it's good. It's a new creation. It's something altogether better than what was. Now, I lost a bunch of you because you're like, look, I have a Samsung and I like it more than. Don't miss the point. You're not just a software upgrade of what you used to be. You're altogether new, a new creation. And that's how he sees you. And it's time for us to start living into the transformational truth of what he says about us, regardless of how we feel about ourselves. And here's something else that seems phenomenal. And with our adoption and identity, we have been given all the rights and the privileges as a child of God. And there is so much that comes with it. He just lavishes, remember that alert? That he just lavishes it on us. And I'll take you back to my, to my original adoption documents. It, it says on page two, article four of my adoption papers, that Andrew Joseph Smith hereby becomes the adopted son of Harry M. Smith with all rights of inheritance and support from Harry M. Smith as provided by the laws of the state of Indiana. He goes, you're mine, and because you're mine, everything I have is now yours. And I'll tell you something else about legal adoption. It goes all the way back to theological adoption. Check this out. My dad can disown his biological children. My dad cannot disown his adopted son. Oh, somebody missed that right there. <laughs> Do I need to draw it out for us? <laughs> Legally, he can disown his natural children. Legally, he cannot disown his adopted child. On your best day, God loves you. On your worst day, he loves you. What God in Christ did for you, there's nothing you can do to undo it. Security is something that we long for. Security in the goodness and the relationship with God. Some of y'all walking around on eggshells thinking that you're going to make God mad and he's going to send you reverse papers saying, what I did, I'm going to undo based on something that you did. There's nothing that we did to get what God gave us. How could we be so arrogant and prideful to think there's something that we could then do to undo what only he could do to begin with? And because of that, we are adopted and secured and given an inheritance. Everything that he says, he's like, I, everything that I have, I give to you. It says in Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, in Christ, we are blessed with every spiritual 
blessing. Every spiritual blessing. Here's what it doesn't say. You are blessed with every material blessing. Somebody was like, oh man, like that's not an addendum in there. It's not a, no. Our reward is not to be fully realized in this life. Because the kid with the most toys in the end doesn't win. They just get to pass it along to another generation who's not going to appreciate it and probably end up squandering it. We just had some parents in here going, man, why am I working so hard to give them stuff that they're not even going to use someday? Like the goal of what we are collecting is not in this life. It's an inheritance that transcends this life. And of all the spiritual blessings, I started doing this deep dive this week and I was like, man, I'm going to go through every spiritual blessing in Christ that we've received. This will be like a four-hour message, and nobody wants that because you want to see the Carolina Panthers beat the Niners. But anyway, just to name a few, here's some, here's some of the spiritual blessings that we've received in Christ. Grace. Grace. God loved us, lavished on us, came towards us when we were unlovable. When we were moving away from him, he progressed towards us. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We couldn't manufacture it. We couldn't prove it. We couldn't work for it. But yet he offered it. That is something that is absolutely phenomenal. And it's hard for us to really wrap our heads around, if we're really honest, right? Because there's nothing on this planet that we see that is grace-based. Everything is transactional in our life. You do this, you get this, right? You act like this, then you get this. You act like this, then you get this. You do this, and they move here. You do something else, they move here. It's all transactional. God goes, um, you're unlovable, and you can't reach perfection. Therefore, I will move towards you. Why? It's grace. What did I do to deserve it? Nothing. How did I earn it? Not a thing. What do I need to do? Receive it. Just receive it. It's hard for us. Even as humans, we can be gracious givers and miserable receivers. God wants us to be gracious receivers. And if we understand this beauty of grace that we receive, it enables us and helps us that much more to demonstrate it to others. We've been given grace. We've been given forgiveness. Man, I can't preach on forgiveness enough. Some of you have been holding on to things that are making your heart and your soul and your mind sick for so long. It has controlled your actions. It's turned in resentment to bitterness. It's like a cancer of your soul. And the divine physician tells us through forgiveness that he wants to operate in that spot to let it go. But until we understand the degree in which we have been forgiven, it's hard for us to forgive other people. Do you know what you deserve? Here, here we go. What we deserved from God? Separation. That's what we deserved. Like, God, give me. See, don't ever pray that. Like, God, give me what, what I deserve. He's like, well, I don't think you want that. I don't think you want that. Stop praying that, that sense of entitlement. God, give me what I deserve. What you deserve is separation, eternal separation, void of any of the love, the good, the peace, the joy, the grace, anything that you experience in this life, a place of void of anything of the goodness of God. That's what we deserve. What we got was forgiveness. And forgiveness offered us into relationship. So we've been given grace. We've been given forgiveness We've been given redemption. Everything has a price. And so did our lives. And God paid it in the person of Jesus. You know what I think is so beautiful about the God that we serve is he never asks us to do anything that he had himself hasn't done first. He said, I will pay the price. I will pay the price for your life. To make you a new creation. And not just spiritual redemption. There's another part of it that I, I call situational redemption. Because a lot of us, we try to make heads or tails of areas and seasons and situations in our lives. We really can't see what's going on when God redeems that in a way that only he knew. But that at a later time, maybe he gives us eyes to see. You know what I mean? You're like, God, why am I in this place? Why is this thing happening? 
And you know what? I could preach about it, but here's a great story from Liz that tells about situational redemption. Check it out. for about two years now. I recently moved out to the Madeira Ranchos um, in May of this year. I was about to buy a house in Fresno and we were in escrow and for whatever reason, there were so many things, just the, the door shut on that house and um, I was pretty bummed, I was disappointed. I didn't know what God had in store. I didn't know what the next years were gonna look like. Um, I knew I had ambitions about getting a house with my family but God opened the door and here we are. I was a little bummed too to be away from the community I was in because I was kind of in the same neighborhood block as uh, the bridge where they are now. And then found out that the bridge is moving <laughs> and closer to my home. And so I was really excited because moving out here, I realized that there's such a big grand need for ministry, for God, for a church that's able to house um, a community. I had no idea that just bridge had property out here um, and that things were happening. Um, I just felt really excited about what God was going to do or what God is doing and um, being a part of that too. Um, there's a need for a church to lead this community in a particular direction. So I am super excited about what God's going to do and what he's continuing to do and um, the part and the role that um, we play in that. Over the last two years, I really feel like I've gone from watching to being a part of. And so now that I'm a part of and involved and I feel like I'm right in this journey with where our church is headed, as excited as I am about all of these changes and stuff, it's really definitely um, challenged me to kind of check myself and where I am um, as a believer. I, I know that there are things in this community that are needed. I've been actually um, noticing there's a lot of new mommies. I'm a new mommy. I have a three-month-old. Actually just been thinking about it, um, how great and awesome it would be to have a mops group out here at the ranchos. There's a lot of new mommies. Mommies oftentimes get forgotten and um, it would be great for them to be poured into and encouraged and given Jesus, given love and I'd love to be part of that. So yeah, I've just, I've been feeling challenged and excited at the same time. And we wanted to capture Liz's story because it's such a beautiful one of situational redemption. Like all of her plans, all the things that she wanted, where she wanted to go. It just didn't seem like it was coming together. And then she found herself in a place that she didn't necessarily want to be, only for God to reveal what was happening around her. And many times if we would just ask God in those situational uh, moments and areas of our lives, like, Lord, how do you want to redeem this? That's part of the blessing that we receive. In Christ, you've also received an inheritance not to be paid out in full here, but one day ahead, we have no idea what lays in store for us. Jesus said, look, if, if I go to prepare a place for you, will I not also return that you might be where I am? And you know what? In the, in the meantime, another spiritual blessing is he has also filled us with his spirit to deposit filled us with his spirit, that he would redeem that for this future inheritance. I mean, the fact of the matter is, where, where I want to land this is that the Father loves you so much, he gave the Son for you. He gave the Son for you. Because I've come to realize adoption costs. I mean, for my dad, there, there was a, a monetary cost to go through the legal means in which to legally adopt me as his son. There was also a huge gamble because he was adopting a three and a half year old. He had no idea what lay in store and he was probably questioning his decision when I was a high schooler. He's like, what have I done? There was a cost. And you know what? For God the Father to adopt us, there was a cost. And it was the Son. The Son was the price for our adoption. And in the midst of all that we're doing, we realize that there's a cost 
to everything. There's a cost to following Jesus. And there's also the great cost of moving forward and advancing the kingdom in ways that we need to position ourselves to see what God wants to do in and through us. I mean, that's why I, I constantly want us to, to keep these commitment cards in a place that we're praying for and that we're seeing and that we're saying like, God, in the midst of this whole initiative that we're moving towards to the fastest growing, most underserved region in our valley, Lord, what's the cost that you want me to contribute to your work? Be praying that, be thinking about it. Man, we are a church for this valley. We are a church for the gospel. And we are a church for you because we understand that if God is for you, that we are for you. And we are for you for us to understand and to live into the greatness and the beauty of the identity of the one who loved us and gave his life for us. That we might live to the fullness in this life with the hope of the life to come. Amen. Lord, thank you that you have loved us in such an extravagant way. That you have withheld nothing from us. You gave your very son. You showed extravagant sacrifice in giving. You did it first. And Lord, you've had adopted us. You've given us a new name. You've given us an inheritance. You have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Promises too many to count that you speak about us and over us now that we are your children. Lord, I pray that we would live into the fullness of our identity, that we would live into the fullness of who you say about us and not what we think about ourselves or not what we feel about ourselves or not what somebody else has said about ourselves. Lord, thank you that we're not just a, a dusted off, upgraded version of who we used to be. We are a new creation. Thank you, Lord, that you're for us to that degree and to that beauty. In Jesus' name, amen.